this week in the Parsha portion of Kisovo, we read about the mitzvah of bringing the new fruits and the new grains, known as Bikurim, same word as Bechor, or as the firstborn, this is the first of the new fruits, the farmer, the orchard keeper, the vineyard keeper, when he sees the first of the fruits ripening, he, uh, he immediately tags them and he designates them that these will be the Bikurim to be brought to the Temple Mount to express one's thankfulness and gratitude to Hashem for giving us the land. That's the conclusion of the declaration of thankfulness. And the Torah tells us that one only has this obligation only after we're settled in the land. The status of Bikurim, it's the first of the fruits, has the same status as the first tithe from the grain or the fruits that are given to the Kohen, known as Truma. When you tithe the dough, which is known as Chalo, this is given to the Kohen. This is also, that is the Truma of the bread, it's called Chalo. This was upon immediately entry, entering into the land. The tithing of the first harvest, the tithing of the bread, as soon as you enter the land, you have that obligation to tithe the produce and to tithe the bread, the dough. But in terms of Bikurim, to identify and to express your gratitude for all that Hashem has done for us, going back to Yaakov Abinu, that he could have been killed by Laban as he was pursued, it was only because God's intervention, he was not, that only begins after we're settled in the land, after we've conquered, after we're settled, each person in his portion. But to speak about an expression of gratitude, to be appreciative, what does one need? One needs focus. Focus is not just being able to look at something, but in terms of our minds are distracted with many things which do not allow us to be feel secure, you're not able to internalize the value of what you've received and to appreciate all that whoever has done for you. So therefore, to be able to be in a position mentally, emotionally, to be focused sufficiently, to be able to internalize all the good that Hashem has done for us, from literally going back from we had left Aram Narayim, we left the home of Lovam, where the majority of Yaakov's children were born there. And miraculously, he escaped from the laws of, jaws of the lion, literally. Literally, miraculously, we recount all those events from that moment, going to Egypt, leaving Egypt, whatever Hashem has done for us, the miracles, and we have arrived finally to the land which Hashem has promised us. That's the declaration of our gratitude to Hashem. But that's only after 14 years that we're already settled in land, then we have this obligation to offer this gift and to express our gratitude to Hashem. Because only then can one truly internalize it and be sufficiently focused to be able to actually say it with that level of feeling and sincerity and dedication. Parsha begins Vahoya. So over here the Orachim Kodesh explains Vahoya is, is an expression of Simcha. By Yehi, the Gemara tells us in the Gila, is always an, an indication that alludes to time of strife, suffering. Vahoya is always an expression of joy. Vahoya Kisavu Lawrence. It's a moment of joy. So he explains. To, to reveal to us, to arouse us in the smoch elibishibas oritz. What is the true joy when we settle in the land? It's not any land. You know, Jews need a land. Go to uh, Biafra or wherever you're going to go, Angola. 
That, that's the land means specifically Eretz Yisrael, land that was gifted to us, that was promised us, to Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and we being their descendants, was given to us as a gift. Why? The land of Eretz Yisrael is called Eretz HaKadoshah. It's the holy land. What makes it holy? Anything that God has an intimate relationship with, association with, is the basis for Kedusha, holiness. There's no other location in the world that's holy other than Eretz Yisrael. That means God has this very personal relationship with Eretz Yisrael, the Temple Mount, the ultimate menucha, the lo final location where God says, that is my location, that's Yushalayim, that's the Temple Mount. That is the location. To be privileged, to be given the land that that is the equivalent of, as it's referred to in many works, it's referred to as Paltin Shomelech. You're entering into the palace of the king. That's what Israel, Eretz Yisrael is. Sight and Svarim, that if a person sins in Chutzloretz, outside of Israel, the sin is not as severe, although it's the same sin. If you sin in Eretz Yisrael, it's much more severe. Why? Because a person sins elsewhere, it's like in the hinterlands. You're not within the proximity of the king, although the whole world is God. But in terms of the way we relate to things, where you're entering into his domain, his domain is Eretz Yisrael. You've already entered into the courtyard. Now as you get close to Yushalayim, that's the inner sanctums. The altar in, in, in Inner sanctum is the Holy of Holies, which is the Kohen Godel, which is the High Priest, and is to anti on Yom Kippur. But that's what it is. So if a person has the privilege that he's invited as a Ben Melech, as a prince, to enter into the palace, this causes one of the greatest level of jo joy. I mean, where otherwise, you know, you have a king in exile, you have a prince in exile. God says no. This is, this is your location. You're welcome to come to my palace. And you have to acknowledge the value and that joy, the privilege that you feel privileged to be a Jew and to be able to do this. I always say the certain innate characteristics of people which indicate whether they're quality or they're not quality. A quality person, immediately, if he's the recipient, He's appreciative. Appreciation is, is a, a marker of a quality person. You're appreciative. A person who's just on the receiving end, not on the giving end, doesn't reciprocate, doesn't show any degree of reciprocation, he's not a quality person. He's here for himself and only for himself. In the vernacular, you say he's a taker. But again, he's a deficient person. He's deficient. He's not a quality person. A person who truly appreciates and has the capacity to see the value of what he's received, that's an indication that he's a quality person. So that the Jew comes to <coughs> once a year to express his thankfulness, his joy for what God has given him and recounts everything that he attributes his whole existence, not only the present, the moment, but that exists, period. We wouldn't left Egypt, we wouldn't exist. If Yaakov and his family would have been killed, we wouldn't exist. So every aspect of our lives and every opportunity we have, both spiritually and materially, is all attributed to him, if that's the case. How joyous and how selflessly giving do we have to be to God to show that degree of what, of, 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 of beholding this to him. And that exactly, that is the... But what is, the, what is the prerequisite to all that? It's recognition. Very often the person doesn't recognize. The person believes, people believe things happen just by themselves. You know, the sun rises, the sun sets. You put a seed in the ground. Well, nature says if it germinates, if the soil is quality, it's going to germinate, then it's going to grow. It's not so simple. You know, the river's not supposed to overflow its bank. It's only, only supposed to have so much rainfall per year. What about when you have a year's rainfall in 24 hours? What happens to a city? With all the advancement and everything. It's a disaster. The closest thing to the, to the great flood. And there's no way to control it. 
So how do you take it for granted? Well, that's out of the ordinary. You know, there was a shift. You know, and it's not a shift. Because God wills the world should function as it functions, it's meant to function. Well, the eclipse takes place every once in a thousand years, there's this kind of eclipse. It's not going to happen unless you live another thousand years. Because that's where it happens. Or it happens because God says that's where it's supposed to happen. So again, it's all processing it and understanding why things happen the way they happen. If you understand they don't happen because that's the way they're supposed to happen, but that's only because God wills it to happen that way, then you're a recipient of what? Of God's willingness and goodness and givingness, and then there, there, there has to be an appreciation. But if you take it for granted and you notice nothing, there's no reciprocation. There's nothing. The two aspects to Bikurim. There's the bringing of the Bikurim and there's the declaration of the Bikurim. You bring the new fruit, the first of the fruit, which usually is the most endeared to the farmer, even that I give away, and then you have the declaration. But the declaration, based on the Pasuk, on the verse, is only from Shuas through Sukkot. Till Sukkot. Why? Because this is the harvest season. The person who's bringing in the bounty and he sees the prophets and he sees the bracha, he's in a joyous mindset. So when you're in a joyous mindset, it's easier and you feel the bounty, you feel the gift. It's easy, it's easier to express one's gratitude. The person is down and out, you could be the greatest believer in the world. You know, you have to be nothing is and even in the most difficult times he's singing the praises of God it's not so simple the obligation of Bikurim is in every Jew said the setting has to be conducive to be able to express that gratitude and thankfulness it's interesting The more entitled a person feels, the less he feels he has to be beholden, express gratitude. But if a person is truly humble, and the more humble you are, the less entitled you feel, so whatever is given to you, you see as something significant, and even more than, something very major in your life. And therefore, it's like you're overwhelmed with the kindness and the blessing that Hashem gives you and therefore it's impossible not to express your gratitude. Once mentioned the name of the Chavetz Chaim Shlomo says Ki lekech tov nasat lechem torosi al tazov Hashem says God says I've given you my best commodity lekech tov and therefore, don't abandon my Torah. What is that? Lekar tov, that commodity, that acquisition? Torah. Don't abandon it. So, um, time explains, King Solomon is the wise man who ever lived. He had everything in the world. And he says, God says, this is the ultimate commodity. Don't abandon it. He says, he explains, you have a minister. A minister lives in a very elaborate, ornate, affluent type of life. He's a minister of the king. He lives also in a, a type of palace. But it's not the palace of the king. And his vessels and his personal effects are not worth a king's ransom. But versus a commoner, it's something exceptional. So what the commoner values as special, the minister doesn't value as special was the minister, he's in another echelon of society. And what's available to him is not avail available to the commoner. What about what's available to the minister? Does the prince, the son of the king, does he value what's so special to the minister? The answer is no, because the prince being on an echelon, he's, other, he's the son of the, the king. And what about the king himself? What's fit for a king is not fit for a prince. It's another echelon. 
And what about <coughs> the greatest mortal king, what he values? What about the various echelons of angels? The lowest echelon of angel. What is the greatest king's ransom to that angel? It's worthless. It's nothing. Finite, material, earthy, limited. Spirit, the spiritual world is infinite. There's no impurity. There's holiness. You have a relationship with God without any level of interference. What about the angel that's above that echelon? So what the lesser angel understands, it's considered pittance compared to what the greater angel. And as you advance the different levels, but what all the angels understand, as great as they are, they're still finite beings. They have limitation. What God understands and what God is, it's all meaningless. The angel is meaningless to God. Everything's meaningless to God. But God says to call you, sir, to the Jewish people, Lekach tov no These are God's words. I'm giving you the best commodity. So what? Nobody values God says this is the ultimate. So God says it's the ultimate. So how, how are we supposed to value it and relate to it? The Torah is the ultimate. God is quantifying this the ultimate. Then we tell you don't abandon it. So to appreciate that. But how do you appreciate it? Well, you know, I think I'm deserving. I'm entitled. You know, I'm entitled to take off three weeks to take a break. If you're entitled, then you don't understand what God's talking about. Of course, if you understand that every aspect of your being only functions as it, as it does because God willed it to be as that, and everything's a gift in life, everything's predestined except your free will, your your choice. So what are you entitled to? You know, it's your, your own fantasy, your own delusion that you believe you're entitled. So if you are truly humble and you understand that you're entitled to nothing and God says this is the ultimate gift, once you don't have that interference, then you gravitate towards it. You're attracted to it. Because God said, so to be appreciative, appreciation, now it's interesting. <coughs> the midst of Bikurim is only the produce <coughs> and grain from Israel proper. What about Trans Jordan Sod? Every Yardin. Every Yardin, there's no, according to one opinion, there's no Bikurim. Why? Because it says in the Pasuk, Kisavo Elohar Tzashar Hashem. Which God is giving to you as a portion. Ever Yardain was Lokhumi Atzmon. They took it themselves. Right? Ruven, God, Heaven, Shrab, Menashe, they came to Moshe. We have herds, we have flocks, we need grazing land. They took it themselves. Moshe says, We've got to consult with God. God. So God said, If they're willing to go with their brothers and fight, conquer the land, they're welcome. So ultimately, why is the land theirs? The land is theirs because God okayed it. God allowed them to take it. So what is the, what is the chazal? What does the Medjish say? The land that Hashem has given to you as a nachla to exclude what they took themselves. They didn't take themselves. If God wouldn't have agreed, they would have gone into and Transjordan sides would have been ordinary, ordinary land. Would have had no relevance there to Israel. So again, it's only because God allowed it to be. So what do we look from the Atzma? So how do we understand it? We're talking about an expression of appreciation. What did you do to have the right that the land should be yours? Nothing. God gifted it. It's a gift. You're coming to the land, Hashem, no silver, nachlu. He's giving to you. He's gifting it to you. He never wanted to give to transform inside. It was look from the Atzma what you say to the person. So therefore here there's no question. You have to express your gratitude. This is purely. Another person would say, trans Jordan side. If it wouldn't have been for my initiative, would God agree? So I also have a degree of input. Like a person says, you know, Mark tells us, one's yearly stipend 
is designated allocation for Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. Not a cent more, not a cent less. And if it's more, that means you're withdrawing from your, from your principle in the world to come. That's, that's what you're doing. A person goes and he does a deal. And he succeeds. His ego's inflated. Do you, do you see my negotiating ability? Do you see my, my charisma? My intellect? My presence? It's due to, you know, I was mentored by, uh, by in Princeton by the person who won the Nobel Prize in economics. That's the reason why I was able to close the deal. Because when I walked in, they thought this is Bill Gates number six. And therefore, I, I was able to close the deal. What about the Bill Gates couldn't close the deal, but you could close the deal? Why? Why? Because the answer is for God. But if I wouldn't, of course, if God could have prevented it from happening. But you mean to say, I have no part of closing the deal? It's me. It's my personality. It's my initiative. If I would have stayed home, like some other people, waste their lives away, could have I succeeded to this degree? So right away, there's always a takeaway, there's something, I have something to do with this. Eretz Yisrael, you have nothing to do with. Without a question, it's a gift. You took no initiative, you were sent there, you were told to go there, and just take it over. We didn't learn. The Maraglin, we, we wanted for 40 years, because they didn't understand that, that it's a gift of God, as we said. They thought they'd have to defeat the giants, God says, I'm delivering it to ten and free. It's not up to you. It's a gift from A to Z, from beginning to end. How can you not be beholden? And Yaakov would have been killed by Lavan. God came to Lavan in a dream and says, don't touch him. Don't do anything. Egypt, it would have been impossible to leave Egypt. If not for the ten plagues, splitting of the sea, whatever happened. This would have happened by itself. So it's all Hashem. There's no way in any way to interpret it or to process it differently. So now, you're able to be appreciative. But you find people still not appreciative. But then, if that's the person, you're faulting the person. That's the person. Ebi the Transjordan side, God is not going to demand that you have to be that beholden that the fruits from there because it's something which it's more difficult. But this is an easy one. Just to keep focus, once a year, you bring the new fruits, make the declaration, and understand where it all comes from. That's it. Nothing more than that. It's interesting. There's a famous argument between Rambam and Ramban if the obligation to pray is the Torah obligation at the Raisa or only Jarabonah. Eza avodi should believe. Ulo avdo b'cholavavchim. You should serve God with all your heart. And the Gemara says, Eza avodi should believe. This is tefillah. What's the service of the heart? Tefillah, prayer, praying to God. So Rambam writes, it's it's a Torah interpretation. It's not what we call an asmachta. It's not a rabbinical reliance. But the Torah is saying you must serve God with your heart. Prayer once in every 24-hour period is a Doraisa, the Torah obligation. The Ramban, Nachmanides, writes now, it's Rabbanu. It's not smart On a Torah level, one doesn't have to pray. There's certain times you have to pray, but on an ongoing basis, unless there's an exceptional reason, like there's a, we're under attack, or it's a time of, 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 of sorrow, or pain, or danger, you have an obligation to pray. No obligation. But the Chiv Doraisa, the Torah obligation is once a day, not three times a day. So that that we pray three times a day, that's rabbinical. Rabbinical. Evening, morning, afternoon. Right? Shachris, Mitchum, Ayrif. You wake up in the morning, you have to pray. Midday comes, again. Before you put your head on the pillow, again. Aris. Why is it once a day enough? Five once a day enough. Pray once. The Torah obligation is once a day, but Chazal legislated three times a day. Ramban says there is no obligation to our level. It's all rabbinical. So good. So Chazal said the rabbis legislate three times a day you must pray. Why? 
Why must you pay? It's interesting. The uh, Orachim Kodesh writes a famous question. We said Nasa Nishma. We accepted Torah unequivocally. So why did God have to put a mountain over our heads? We already said we accept. So he explains the Orachim Kodesh that what he wanted them to accept are rabbinic enactments and fences that the rabbis will legislate in the future. And that they said, look, but it's endless. Well, every turn you turn, they're going to shackle us with some kind of rabbinic restriction, with all kinds of fences. We'll be fenced in. God says, you must accept. Because without the fence, you cannot survive. The Torah law cannot survive. Unless you have all the precautions, all the safety measures to protect the Torah itself. That was the cup from our Kigis, therefore God put the mountain over our heads. So Rachel Mekorosh. Now, what is the most dangerous part of a human being's makeup? His ego. The ego is inflated. I know better. It's me, it's I. And the Torah tells us, I mean the Gemara tells us, that a person who's truly egotistic, God says the world's not big enough for both of us. God cannot tolerate a person who's arrogant and self-centered. The Rabbi Miyona writes in Sharon Tshuva, the gates of penitence, repentance, that to be able to succeed in all our skirmishes and battles with the evil inclination, we need a tremendous amount of siyat and bishmaya. We need divine assistance. What if God says, you know, I can't tolerate you because you're an arrogant. You're arrogant, self-centered, pompous, egotistic. God says, I want nothing to do with you. So that means God is actually abandoning that person. So if you're abandoned and you're with the enemy without any weaponry, what do you do? You have problems. So therefore, okay, so how do we temper the ego? How do we somehow put it, keep it in check? To see things as you should see it, not be carried away with who we are. Very often a person has endless failings. As much as he takes initiative, he fails. We speak about Ishtadlus. The person has to, you know, I mentioned many times, named it in the Sharim, Ramchal, that if if one's yearly allocation is preset, sit home, the check's coming in the mail. Just open the window, and the bounty comes through the window. What do we have to take initiative? So he explains, because when Odom had eaten of the Eitz Adas, the curse to mankind was every human being eats bread by the sweat of his brow. Taking initiative is a fulfillment of that aspect of the curse to man. So without initiative, when you meet the standard of the allocation is not released. You know, you have a vault with the amount of money that you're supposed to have for the year. You want your money, open the vault. You have to open it. You may take an effort. The safe ways, the door loans a half a ton. You may have to enlist a hundred other people to, to open it. But if you, it's there for you. But you have to open the vault door. Same thing. God says you have to open it. You have to take initiative. Without initiative, it doesn't go. What a person takes initiative and still doesn't happen. A number of reasons. Maybe it wasn't meant to be. But how do a person really feels that his, he has some self-value. What does he mean to do? Takes it as a reflection on, on, on himself? You know something? Something's wrong. Everybody succeeded. Why aren't they succeeding? What does he do? He goes into a depression. How many times could I experience failure? How many times could they say no to me? How many times a day do I want the door slammed in my face? Do you think it's being slammed in your face? God has slammed the door in your face. That's who slammed the door in your face. This person, it's like the, the Chinuch writes, there's a Torah prohibition, losikom losito. You're not permitted, the Jews not permitted to take revenge or harbor ill feeling against this fellow. So he explains why. Why is a person victimized? Of course, the victimizer, he's culpable because he chose to victimize the person. But why does the God allow the person to be victimized? Because the God wants him to be victimized. The person's only the tool through which God wants him to be victimized. He explains it's like a person has a hammer. 
what smashes whenever the hammer comes in contact with it's the hammer. If the person behind so God is using the victimizer or the event for the person to receive what he's meant to. So to harbor ill feeling against that person, it's not the person. Because if God didn't want you to be harmed or affected negatively, it wouldn't have happened. Or to be turned down, you needed a favor. And the person turned you down. You harbor ill feeling against them. No. It's true, he didn't want, but that's not the reason. Because if God wanted you to receive the loan or to have the favor done, he, you would, you, he would have sent you to a person who would have been agreeable to help you. So who's denying you? It's God. So it's not a reflection on yourself. Maybe you should be depressed because of your spiritual s status, setting, your relation with God, but it has nothing to do with your deficiency, your inability to close the deal. Or people don't like you. It's not people don't like you. Maybe God doesn't like you. That's the reason why you're being mistreated by people. That's the reason. But again, it's all the perspective. That's what it is. So how do you put something in perspective to understand it's God and it's not you? To when you see it or, or fail. Either way, either way it goes. Speaking to somebody recently, and this person has, he's, he's in practice, he's an observant Jew. But he has very serious questions about God about many things. And uh, so I said to him, I said, what do you, what do you think, what, God knows what your needs are. If you believe in God, God knows what you need. So what do you have to pray to God? He knows what you need. If you have needs, he'll give you your needs. What do you have to pray? Because the answer is, of course, you have to be deserving. You have to acknowledge God that what? That he's the one who wills that you should have. And because of that level of acknowledgement, that's what you deserve to receive. Because that, the whole purpose of existence is to acknowledge him and the merit of acknowledge him, that's why you're worthy. God needs nothing. It's purely for the benefit of the person. That the person should be the beneficiary, but you have to be deserving. So by acknowledging that the source of blessing is him, therefore you, you, now you're deserving. Give me livelihood. Give me health. Whatever you're asking for. <coughs> what do you mean? Cut a mail corner afford the whatever they have over there. Or go to the uh, NIH. They have uh, ex experimental type of uh, treatment. The guy, man's not even sick. He's going to NIH. What do you want to NIH for? Yeah, but again, people themselves. Many years ago, there was an incident. A certain person had done something. Observant Jew. And um, he had cancer. And he was went to treatment in Sloan Kettering. He had the best doctors. Him in Israel. And somebody said to him, maybe the reason why you came down with cancer is because you had done something which had offended Rav Steinman. You should live and be well asleep. Which he did. And the person says, it's irrelevant. I have the best doctors, the best medication, the best treatment. I'm not worried. The person said to him, and the person who spoke to this person evaluated and said, Is it it's irrelevant what kind of medication you have, what kind of, what kind of doctors you have, what kind of hospital you have? If you don't work it out and straighten out this, this situation with Steinman, it's not going to help you. And it's over. You're going to succumb to your cancer. It really resonated very strongly with him. It hit him like a thunderbolt. So he said to him, I'm afraid to go myself. Would you accompany me? So this person accompanied him, Rosh Diamond. And they went, and Rosh Diamond said to him, I have no claim against you. But because of what you did, it's between you and God. You have to work it out with Hashem. It has nothing to do with me. God has a claim against you. And if you work it out with Him, you recover. You don't work it out with Him, it's irrelevant what kind of, what kind of medical care you have, what you have available, it's all irrelevant. It's not going to happen. So whatever it was, he worked it out. Thank God, it's been years. He's, he's in check. But he went for remission. He, he recovered. Whatever it is. Baruch Hashem, he's okay. This person. Okay? But again, how do you put things in perspective? How do you keep your ego in check? How do you keep it at the front door and don't bring it in? And let it taint everything. 
you know, you have um, deodorants or air fresheners. What does it do? So some air fresheners say it just covers up the scent. Others that actually it destroys the bad, the bad, the cause of the bad scent. We want to destroy, not just cover up. The person will try to act humbly, but he's really arrogant. That means you have to recognize why you're not who you think you are. Now, that's keeping the ego in check. That's called deflating the ego. How do you do that? Well, Bikurim is one way to do it. God says once a year, from all from the species of the fruits of Israel, from the grains of Israel, at a time when you get, have your bounty, so you have no excuses. Things aren't great. I'm in the down mood. You're, you're experiencing ecstasy here with all your success. You could take, attribute it to yourself. You're the best farmer in the world. Take your best fruits. Go to the Temple Mount. Make your declaration. Recount all that God had done for you while you exist as a person and while you have your success. Trace it to its source. And then prostrate yourself before God. And then you'll be able to rejoice in all that you have. Because then you'll realize it's unrelated to you. It's a gift of God. Because if you negate yourself to such a degree by prostration, which means you know better than the dust on the earth, then you'll rejoice in everything that God gave you. Then you'll realize you're entitled to nothing. So if you're entitled to nothing, all of a sudden you get endless bounty. It's unbelievable. This is something I always say, a tzaddik, he always sing, he's always singing God's praises. Whatever happens in his life, everything is out of the ordinary. Why? Because he feels no entitlement. Why does God do it? What am I deserving? Why am I so special? It's because of his humility. So he could give easily, he could give all his money away to charity, to support Torah. He has no problem. Did he work for it? God gave it to him on a silver platter. The other person who feels entitlement, he works 20 hours a day in the office. He says, this, 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 this course, this is my flesh and blood. This is the sweat of my brow. You tell me, God gave this to me. I'm entitled. I'm entitled. I have a right to do what I want. Nobody tells me what to do with my earnings, with my success. I'm a self-made man. Okay, self-made man. Okay, so you want to be self-made? Invest your whole life in being a self-made man. That's it. Because God's not going to do it to you. He'll make you, he'll let you crawl and drag yourself through the mud to get to the top of the hill. The other person, he'll have a ski lift to bring him to the top, the tzaddik, straight to the top. To pick up his, his yearly stipend, takes it right back down. God says, I should bother my tzaddik. Better he should do better things than, than shovel gravel all day and be in, in, in the salt pits, salt mine all day. That's, that's, that's the difference between the tzaddik and the person who's not the tzaddik. You recognize that you're undeserving, then you're deserving. If you believe you are deserving, that's when you're not deserving. Because then you attribute every, all your successes to yourself. And that's the reality of life. So there's an interesting measure. There's a possible good deal of a verse. Bo nishtachve v'nichroch Let's come and bow and kneel. We should bless before God our Maker. So the Midrash addresses what's the difference? Kriya, Kriya normally means kneeling. Hishtarvoya means prostration. Matal Mudloma Nishtachva Vinichro Nibracho. What does the prostration and the kneeling have to do with and be blessed? Elatsofa Moshe Brucha Kodesh. Moshe Bain who saw through his holy vision. Rosh Migdosh Osilikhorif. The base of each ultimate is going to be destroyed. Babi Kurim Asidli Posik. Once the base there's no one base of Migdash, it doesn't bring the new fruits, because you bring the new fruits to the base of Migdash, to the Temple Mount, to make your decoration, the basket, you put it to the Mizbeach. Omad vihiskli soshu mispali sholosh pomuchul yom. See, he went and he enacted that Jews should pray three times a day. 
since there's no longer be Bikurim, you have, must pray three times a day. Lefi shechavigo tefilo lefnei HaKadosh Baruch Hu mikol masim tov mikol HaKorbanus. Because God values tefilo more than all good deeds and the, even the sacrifices. How do we see this? Shekaksiv. Tikon tefilosi katoris lefanecho. My tefilo is perfected like the incense offering before you. Kapai mitchas oret ebayi. When I extend my hands, it's like the gift of the evening. Moshe Rabbeinu, Api Shosu Kol Masim Tovim. Is there any Jew who's ever been proven? Moshe Rabbeinu, Kevin Shinig Zolov Shli Konings Lord. It was decreed he should not enter the land. What did he say? He spalei Vomer. He prayed. Eber Nov Ere. Vomer Lo Akadosh Baruch Hu Atosiv Daber Elayo B'Daber Aser. He says, I don't want to hear about it. What do you mean? But he has all this merit behind him. He has all the deeds. He's the one who brought Torah to Klal Yisrael. There's only Jewish people because of him. Yet, he understood the only way he crossed that Jordan is only with tefillah. So we say, despite all his deeds, Hashem values tefillah. That's why Hashem says, I don't want to hear about it anymore. I don't want you to pray that you should have the merit of tefillah. So therefore, as a result of understanding the value of tefillah, so since there's no longer be, be, be kurim, he legislated, enacted, you ha- a Jew has to pray three times a day. Shachar Smith Chamayrev. Morning, afternoon, and evening. What relevance one has to do another? We say in Pirkei Ovos, Al Shlosh and Borum, Olam Omeid. Torah Avodah Gimel Tzalsodi. Study of Torah Avodah. What does Avodah normally mean? Bring sacrifices. But Avodah, today we have no base mention. It's Tfilo. Tfilo is Avodah. Ezi Avodah Shebelev. What is the service of the heart? Tfilo. So whether it's as Rambam, where the Dorai says the Torah obligation once a day, three times is definitely rabbinical. Ramban, although there was no Torah obligation, but one has to pray three times a day. It's based on this. Three, Moshe Rabbeinu enacted, you had Jew has to pray because it's no longer Bikurim. What is Bikurim until the Tefillah? Now, what is Bikurim? Bikurim is you take the best of your battle, your crop every one of the species. You bring it to the Temple Mount and you make your de- declaration before God. All that you have in your life is attributed to Hashem regardless of what your worth is. You know, the Gemara tells us that when you ascended the Temple Mount if you wore a money belt you had to take it off. If you wore shoes you weren't permitted to ascend with a pair of shoes. If you had a walking stick which was an indication of status you couldn't walk up the Temple Mount with a walking stick. Why? You know, you know why? Because when you ascend before God, your financial worth is irrelevant. Your status is irrelevant. You're totally irrelevant. <coughs> you have to feel negated to be able to appreciate. It's a disrespect. You know, we say in, um, in Zichronos, Shana, we say, Hashem Molar Geos Lovish. God is the king. Geos, what's his cloak? His cloak is Geos, Gaido, exaltedness. You know why God can't tolerate a person who's, who's arrogant or has this exalted profile? You know what? Could you imagine oh, years ago in the United States everything is a disaster? But at one time, if you weren't a member of the armed services, if you would wear a uniform, you'd be arrested. Would you have a right to wear a uniform? And if you wear a uniform, you're not a citizen of another co- uh, of, the, of the government? Definitely. What do you, what do you do? You're an imposter. How do you have a right to parade around in, in, a, in a uniform with insignias that are not your insignias? Well, you didn't earn them. Would you have a right? Could you imagine a person, he parades around in regal garments that he's, he put, he's passing himself as the king? The man deserves to go to the gallows. Who ever heard of such a thing? Whose scepter is Gaiva? Is exaltedness? That's God's scepter. How do you override? Could you imagine a man taking God's scepter and behaving like he thinks he's God? As there's an expression in the vernacular, God's gift to humanity. Well, who does this man think he is? It's, it's the ultimate level of arrogance. It's something which is intolerable. How do you tolerate it? So how do you... But that's with the ego. The ego can do that to a person. 
People become egocentric, egotistic, self-centered, pompous. They have swollen heads. It's not due because they have water on the brain. That's not why their heads are swollen. <laughs> right? So how do, you, how do you somehow temper it? You have to put it in perspective. How do you put it in perspective? You wake up first thing in the morning. No Dani will find that Hashemosh. Right? The Shemesh shall desire to be. Shall desire to be the Shemosi. You return my soul. What do you mean? I've had a good eight and hours sleep. I had a perfect uh, health check from the doctor. I can live another 120 years. No problem. As long as I eat healthy, go to the gym. You want to know something? God doesn't want you to wake up in the morning. You're not waking up. Modani lufanecha. Yeah, firstly, you have to acknowledge, firstly, that the reason why you're alive because God returned your soul. That's firstly. Nothing happens by itself. And then, you say, blessings. Why could you stand? Why could you sit? Why could you walk? Make him stay governed. You say, various blessings. Mm-hmm. But what is the Amida? You know, it's interesting. The Ramchal writes that if you really analyze a person's life, the majority of time that we live, we invest in earning a livelihood. Now, why do we need to earn that amount of money for livelihood? Of course, it's, it's our needs, it's the amenities of life. But why the amenities of life? The person says, I have to wear a certain type of garment, a certain quality garment. I need a number of such garments. Why? Why? 3,000 years ago, you know, you could live, you could have a closet which is two by nothing, that was sufficient for your whole wardrobe. Why today do you need three closets? Why? Because that's the lifestyle. That's the standard of living. But why? Therefore, who set the standard of living? Well, it's, it's beneath my dignity. Who heard, heard of the word dignity? When you sit in, the, in, a, in, in solitary confinement in prison, prison, what kind of wardrobe do you have? They let you take a shower once every six months. And then you change your, your clothing, which is barely a, a pajama, call it pajama, they give you another one to wear. So, what is beneath your dignity? What's your dignity? Why so dignified? Why? And what about your residence? Go live in a shack. Move into, move up upstate somewhere. Build your shack for $1,000. Get yourself a, a stove, wood, wood burning stove, you'll heat it. You'll be able to survive. What about some archaic primitive man? To live in, 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 in some kind of shanty. What am I? What's wrong with it? If you're only here t- to succeed and to address your spiritual all this other, that's just it's totally superfluous. It's a waste. See, it goes to show to be, what about food? To be healthy, what do you have to eat to maintain yourself? Cutlery, dishes, glasses, furniture, this, that, whatever it is. That's all, these are, these are all men, these are like, how could you live with, uh, with, with less than that? Why? Because minimally, you don't think I'm entitled to live like every human being? But what does every human being live like? Because they all feel entitled. So you're, you're caught up in the entitlement of society. So he goes to show that the majority of one's life is vested in livelihood, and the majority of livelihood is directly connected to your ego, to your sense of entitlement. But a person would have no sense of entitlement, he'd get by with the barest minimum of anything and you could live healthy and responsibly and focus on your Avodah Hashem. That's what it is. This is like a very special level. But he's saying that's factually, that's what it is. Not, we're all not Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay? So now, why do you pray three times a day? You wake up in the morning. Atochoni Lodam Das. person feels... I have an exceptional mind. I have discretion. I can process. I have an insight. I have intelligence. Where did it come from? It's God in doubt. Proof of the pudding. Every day you wake up. You say, Right? Give me discretion, understanding, ability to process. If, if, it's, if it's meant there, just natural unrelated to God, what do you have to keep asking for the same thing over again? Right? The answer is, you recognize, you know something, 
that you're so smart and you see things right or whatever it is, that's a gift of God. That's what it is. So you can't get carried away. You know, you won't belong to Mensa. You know? Or whatever whatever other uh, club you belong to. Right? Club they smoke special kinds of cigars when they play chess. You know? Man's, you know, gift to humanity. So all, all arrogance, pompousness. And you say, say Brocha al Pneum. Rafainu. Yes, for healing. Yes, you take nothing for granted. So if a person fails, the failing is not attributed to you. You didn't pray, pray hard enough. Of course, he asked God. God said no. Of course, if it would have been yes, it would have been yes. We're talking about it, it puts things in perspective. Why do things happen the way they happen? Because every day, first he acknowledges who God is. First he says, God will he has the capacity to do everything and provide everything. So if he's there, that's the address. Same brocha. He asks him for everything. He's willing to give it. So why isn't he giving it? There must be a reason why he's not giving it. Maybe he didn't pray. Maybe you're not worthy. Maybe you're not deserving. Maybe you have to do tshuva. Maybe it'll distract you and it's not in your best interest. It's like a person's a diabetic. And he's craving for a diet for carbohydrates and foods that will go into a diabetic coma. And you withhold it from the person. Do you fault the person who withholds it? Even though the diabetic is having conniptions and throwing a tantrum that you're not giving what he wants. But he, again, he's a fool. So Hashem very often withholds things from us because that's not your test, that's not your challenge in life. Because if he provides it, it becomes a whole different challenge. He doesn't want you to take that route. Because that root may destroy you. It's too much. It's too overwhelming. Do we know? We have to follow walk the, walk the walk, which Hashem has provided the roadmap. That's the roadmap. So let's say a person is phenomenally successful in the morning. It get, gets to his head, the success. So you know what you do? Hashem, Chazal say, you got to pray again. Mincha. What you were taking, attributing your success to yourself, it's Hashem. Baruch at Hashem, Baruch Hashem, it's God, it's not you. A person works in a very exclusive department store. Only the richest people shop there. He works behind a very sophisticated, computerized cash register. Where only the most sophisticated credit cards go into that cash register. He prides himself. He prides himself. Just a little employee. He have to be comments. What does that do with you? You're in nothing. But you realize where I'm working. It's all nonsense. It's foolishness. God gives you certain things. It's not yours. It's like a person goes and he is an actor. He, and they, he, he wears the suit. He, he's playing the role of Rockefeller. Is he Rockefeller? He's not Rockefeller. You're supposed to be Rockefeller in the role you're playing. You play, it's all role playing. Do you succeed or don't you succeed? It has nothing to do with you. It's all the challenge. It's not. It's given to you because that's what you're supposed to do, the role you're supposed to play. And again, what happens? He has a terrible afternoon. He, in the morning, the market skyrocketed. He just made m enough money people in earn a lifetime. Afternoon, he lost it all. He's, he's, he's in the doghouse. Can't function. Myron, put in perspective. You have to keep going back, putting perspective. It has nothing to do with entitlement. You're entitled to nothing. It's all what Hashem decides in every aspect, every moment of your life. So therefore, the Bikurim, what was the Bikurim? Moshe Rabbeinu foresaw in his divine vision the base is going to be destroyed. And that mechanism of putting the ego in check is not there any longer. That you make your declaration, you bring the best of your grain, the best of your fruits, and you prostrate yourself with whatever. It's not there. So what's going to compensate for that? Tefillah, three times a day. That's the compensation. That's the replacement. But you have to have... Could you imagine a person says, Hashem Sosei, Sifto Kupiyah Gintila. It's humiliating. You're asking God to give you the ability to speak. What is he, a deaf mute? He can't speak? You want to know something? A person goes on an interview and he wants to get the job. And the interviewer is, is, is a professional. 
So he's able to, to tell by the words or what you tell him whether you qualify for this position. And he wants the position. Afterwards, he walks out after the interview and he prepared for it. He realizes he should have said something else. And what he said, he didn't say it right. And he really he agonizes because he didn't present himself correctly. He may not get the job, get the position. So what? Hashem so says, shit off the to live. Are you humiliated? But maybe the words didn't come out right. So when you stand before God, where He's the provider at every level, to say the right words and have the right mind and the right mindset and feel the, the humility when you stand before Him, it's not so simple. He has to give you that insight, that understanding when you say the words that you're touched by those words as you should be touched. What's humility? Who do you think you are? Well, I feel like, like, like I'm treated like a, like, a, like a retarded person, a person with limited intelligence. Well, you, you're only intelligent because he, he says you should be intelligent. Otherwise, you would have limited intelligence or no intelligence. So again, so the tefillah, that's what Moshe Rabbeinu said. Because we, also, he, also, he saw Baruch HaKocho, also, therefore he enacted three tefillahs every day. And that's what it is. Even Ramam, that it's a Doraisa, it's only once a day. Once a day is not enough. This is, these are the fences. This is the Kofim Harkigigis. Without the rabbinic fences, the Torah cannot... Because if a person gets carried away with his ego, even if you pray once a day, you're, out, you're off the roof. You're going in the wrong direction. And you'll self-destruct with your pompousness and your self-centeredness. <laughs> Be continued. Uh, uh, so it was Mo Moshe established it. Too. Originally, he was the one. He prayed, but as an obligation. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. He led as an obligation.